Hey there. So I had a great conversation recently with my friend, Tim Pereira. It was on his show, Tuesdays with Tim. Tim focuses on mental health for high performers. So in our conversation, we talked about mental health at work, what it's like to feel caged, and then strategies and tactics for getting more psychologically and physically fit. Really important topics, right? And Tim was gracious enough to let us take that episode and share it with the Uncage Yourself audience. So this is a replay of that. I know it'll provide you a lot of value. It's a short, punchy episode. So thank you, Tim, for sharing this. If you want to learn more about Tim and what he has to offer, check it out at perwellness.co. And as always, if this show provides you any value for Uncage Yourself, I'd really appreciate it. It means a lot if you could jump on over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and leave a quick review. It means a lot to me. Thanks for everything. All right, let's get to it. Growing up, society taught you to follow the script by choosing a career path and climbing the ladder. But for many people, this promise falls flat. Work suffocates them and life becomes painful. Here, you're trapped in what I call the corporate cage. Fortunately, there's a way out. You can take control of your corporate job and unlock a life of freedom. I call this living uncaged. Hi, this is your host, Matt Doan. I'm a coach, creator, and entrepreneur. Uncaging people is my mission because it's been my exact life journey. This show provides you the stories, principles, and tactics to make it happen. Welcome to Uncage Yourself. All right, guys. Thank you for for joining us today. Another episode of Tuesdays with Tim. Today, my guest Matt. Matt, how do you pronounce your last name? Don. Don. Like okay. Bone. Don. Yeah, yeah. That's what I. That's what Rhymes. I figured. But I don't yep. think we Bone. we talked about that last time. But anyway, um, <laughs> you know, today, guys, brought Matt on to talk about escaping the corporate cage. I love that phrase. And, um, you know, want to dive into it a bit today. And I think, you know, Matt's got a super interesting perspective and background on, on what it means, like what the cage means to him and, you know, what we can do to operate, uh, you know, within our corporate nine to five. We're not saying, you know, that you have to leave or have this mass exodus or anything like that. So anyway, Matt, I want to turn it over to you first and just ask you to, for, for people that don't know who you are, like, who you are as a human being. Ah, let's go there. Try to keep it short and sweet. Yeah. Everyone, Matt Doan, nice to meet you all today. So background wise, I've been, I was in management consulting for 15 years, came out of school that way, always straddling the lines between business strategy and technology strategy. So did a lot of work with national security agencies and global 2000 companies all over the world. As you know, it might know with consultants, you just get on a plane and you fly somewhere every single week and you go to new places and there's lots of perks and that can be fun. And it can also be really, really draining. And you might not be aware of it at the time because you think that's what life is all about. You're finding your self-worth in something like that. I was climbing that ladder. Um, funny enough about, I guess not so funny, seven or eight years in, I was married at the time, had three kids and it just kind of took me apart. My my marriage fell apart. And from that, I lost access to my kids. Uh, mental health was crazy. I was on pills for a long time. Physical health was, I lost like 25 pounds. It was nuts. So I kind of fell apart. And it was a moment, went through therapy, went through uh, getting some coaching in my life. I needed to rebuild myself. And I knew I needed to stay in corporate because I needed to support my large family. <laughs> but I know I needed to be a better version of myself because the way I was working, the way I was letting work consume me was partially destroying my life. And I couldn't let that happen again. So started rebuilding, started trying some new strategies, following my own interests, learning what I wanted to learn, applying myself at work in different ways. Didn't go all, to all the same meetings as everyone else opted for different types of projects, didn't get the same certifications, kind of almost uh, anti-conformist in nature. While everyone else was like following the exact script on how to get promoted and feel good about themselves, I was just following my interests. Funny enough, I, I got promoted too and got recognition and it was like, this is weird. Fast forward, as we got to COVID, 
I had this entrepreneurial bug and I didn't know what to do with it. So I started a coaching business to help people and I didn't know where I needed to help them exactly. But soon enough, I was finding myself helping them, the people that were in the same predicament that I was in. They were in this, what I call the corporate cage, which is an environment where you feel trapped and work is overrunning you and you don't know how to unlock from it. And I was teaching them how to become uncaged. The whole idea of creating freedom right where you are, even within a nine to five that seems grueling and seems daunting, you create freedom there, which then has positive effects on your life where you are mentally, physically better. You are doing better things with your time. You're around for family, friends, pursuing other interests, building side businesses, things of this nature. Uh, so I started a business there. A few months ago, I left consulting. I left corporate for good. I am now out on my own as an entrepreneur. I have been doing this in coaching. I have a cohort-based course that I teach the same thing through and hoping to just keep scaling and helping people in need. I, I love the idea because one of the things I brought up, and even one of my friends said to me early on, I, it was about a post about, you know, uh, going after what you want to do and just like structuring your day around what you want to do. And he, he uh, basically internalized it to say, or, or that I was advising to leave your job. And I think, and it made me just think, I was like, man, so much of that is going around. You know, we hear people like, man, you're work remote, create freedom. Like, don't have a work day, get out, like do your own thing, consult, like freelance, right. You know, creating all these jobs, but it's, I, I swear for the most, you know, for the majority of people, it's not realistic, you know, it's like, or they don't want to, you know, like there's stability in having a nine to five and a paycheck. And it's, it's much, you know, easier to, to bite off being able to find that freedom within the nine to five. And so that's why I wanted to have you on too, because I think it is important just to provide a counterpoint to being like, oh man, ditch the nine to five, you know, work whatever hours you want and instead figure out a way to, you know, get out of that cage and, and really live the life you want. And, you know, it, it shape your day around what's true to you and what you want. So I know you touched on it a little bit, but I'm just curious, like what, how do you view the cage? And like, maybe what are some of the examples of some of the clients you worked at and some of the struggles uh, you know, that they've had, or or I guess like what's kept them in that caged environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So corporate cage is a mental state where you feel trapped and stunted by your work environment. This is not literally the environment trapping you because it can't do that. It's an abstract thing. You are just falling victim to all the pressures, all the time requests, all the tasks of your environment. You're literally just giving yourself to it freely and it's overrunning your life. That's what it's like to feel caged. You are, you could say also trapped within the matrix, right? You are yeah. just stuck within it and you don't know how to unplug and life kind of sucks because of it. The whole idea is how do you create freedom? How do you create a sense of agency, a sense where you're the one in control? You design, to a great extent at least, how you spend your time at work. And even more importantly, how you create time for the life on the outside of work that you really want. Because it's all one harmonized thing, right? Work-life balance, I think, is BS. I would not, I hate that concept. There's mm -hmm. no balance to be had. It's a harmonized life. And it's always asking yourself, first and foremost, what's the life I want to live? And then how does work and other, other features actually enable that life? That's what we're trying to do. So I'm trying to get people out of the corporate cage. I call it living uncaged, very straight to the point, right? But it's creating freedom and being the one in charge at work and at home. You know, I think one of the things, I mean, you mentioned the word control and so much, so many of the challenges or, or roadblocks, I, I should say, of the people I work with is there is, they're ex externalizing control. And so whether it's, you know, their environment, Maybe it's the boss, maybe it's relationships at home, maybe it's, uh, you know, they are, uh, you know, watching Netflix late and they're not able to get sleep. They keep junk food in the house, you know, whatever, whatever it is, whether it's, you know, at work or at home. And one of the biggest shifts is, I think, becoming aware that you are giving up power, that you are making a decision, maybe not consciously, but you're giving control over your decisions and your well-being and your mental state, right? And ultimately it's your life, right? And you are giving control to 
another power. And so this other power is, is kind of holding, you know, I think of like a puppeteer holding the draw or the strings over you. And it's like, it's no wonder we feel, you know, stressed out and anxious and like we're staying on this track and we just don't feel like we have much choice. Right. So I'm just curious. So what, so when you, when somebody comes to you, Mm -hmm. what are, I mean, what are some of the first things you do? Like, how do you get them to either understand or what are the first steps you take? Hey there, one quick note. If you resonate with the content of this show, I'd love to go deeper with you to truly help you transform and uncage yourself. I help people through my uncaged coaching program. It helps you get control of your nine to five and create tangible forms of freedom in your life, time freedom, financial freedom, and more. You'll find a link for my coaching services over at matthewdone.com. Now, back to the episode. So there, there's four big steps that I walk people through. I'll go through them in order just to make them clean and clear. Lots of details cool. underneath. Step one, because you're in pain at work, step one is stop the bleeding. How do you actually recognize all the pain that's taking you over right now, whether it's at work or home, identify it, list it out, and ask yourself, how can you minimize that to the greatest extent possible? And most people, for example, will say, well, I can't control the meetings I have at work or the tasks that come my way or company time that I have to show up for hours. I'm like, I'm going to challenge all three of those points right there. I don't believe any of them. Those are all stories in your head that you've subscribed to. Let's pull those apart and ask, how true are they? Where can you assert yourself? Where can you avoid meetings, opt out overtly or covertly? Where can you carve more time for yourself? Where can you do deep work in during high energy parts of your day so that you're more efficient with your time rather than just wasting time in meetings? How can you do these sorts of things? So stopping the bleeding is key because if we don't get space and time, we can't breathe and we can't do anything big with our life. So that's step one. Step two then is I call start dreaming is giving yourself permission to imagine the life you want. So if you could get a little bit like a life vision, a lifestyle, and think big picture, what do I want 10 years from now? What's all the features between financial freedom, time freedom, health freedom, freedom of purpose, freedom of relationships? I like to use that framework to start asking, what are the things I can dream up? Take any constraints of today off the table. Just think about all the things you could be in the way you want your life to be. You do not limit yourself by today's circumstances. You have to stretch your mind, imagine something beautiful, right? Einstein would say all the time that there's nothing equal to the power of the imagination because that unlocks all sorts of innovation in this world, right? So you have to imagine something big, scary, not just 2x better than what you're doing right now, but like 10x or 100x bigger so that you stretch your mind on what's possible. That's step two, start dreaming. Then we get to actually tactically designing what I call a freedom blueprint where you look across those five dimensions of freedom, time, finance, health, relationship, and purpose, and start specking out, you know, from 10 years and then reverse engineering your way to now, what are the milestones you need to be hitting so that this materially comes to life? For example, if you want autonomy over your day and you don't want to have to worry about money again, well, there's certain career moves you're going to need to make, certain nest egg investments, assets you're going to need to buy, habits you're going to need to build, relationships out in the world that will help inspire you to do this stuff so that this materially comes to life. And then you feel that freedom that you crave. It's not this wishful thinking. There are tangible actions and steps that you take over a period of time. And you're going to pivot as you go. But generally, you need a plan of attack if you're going to create this freedom in your world and live uncaged. And then the fourth step, I like to get really tactical with people. Just activate this plan build here and now habits or or get some projects in motion from a personal development standpoint that are going to move the needle it's kind of the framework i use um that's awesome i i like the the first one was stop the bleeding you know and how you're questioning uh these i guess excuses or reasons more so that they come up with and because that's easy right it's easy to have that external um you know center of control and one of the one of my favorite ideas, I think that really helped me a lot with my mental state in the last couple of years is understanding that uh, like events in general, events and circumstance are objective. They're, they're objectively neutral, right? So like the meetings you have, 
uh, you know, your boss or maybe your work hours or whatever it is, is just neutral. And it's really our perspective that adds a subjectivity to it, right? So it's the individual's perspective that that meeting is shit, right? I'm, I'm sure the, bo- the boss is in the same meeting, right? Their manager and they're setting it up or they think it's an important meeting and crucial. So it's just that whole idea that your perspective is what is controlling the narrative of your situation. And so understanding that, and that doesn't mean like everything moving forward is going to be, you know, sunshine and roses and, and great all the time. There's still times that'll come up that are, you know, you'll be frustrated with humans. It's just, mm-hmm. you know, what's natural, but I think pausing to understand that. And it just allows, I think what it, what it, I'll, I'll speak for myself. What it allowed me to do is it added a little bit of space when something happened or, you know, if there was a circumstance I wasn't exactly, you know, excited about, I at least was able to reflect back on it and, and be like, you know, yeah, it's, it's actually, you know, it's really just me. Like the shitty part is coming from my mind. Like I am telling myself, this is not something I want to be in. And then it's, it's thus causing like suffering, anxiety, stress, you know, whatnot. And then that just, you know, kind of trickles in, trickles into the rest of the day. Yeah. I'll give you an example, Tim, on how I helped unwind one of my clients from a coaching perspective. As we were going through the stop the bleeding process, they yeah. came in and said, I know, I know logically that I'm creating all these beliefs about work on what I must and mustn't do, right? Like I know I'm subscribing to this stuff, but I can't undo that conditioning on my own. It's too painful. Help me. So essentially we had to start a journaling habit. Every day they would write down all the bullshit in their life, which they did not believe. And much of it was stuff they believed the day before, right? I like, I must go to all those meetings. I must immediately respond to people. I must always be available. And I must be available at night, these sorts of things. Yeah. And then actually starting to put in place what you want your day to feel like, the feelings you want to have, the types of activities you want to do. Just generally writing that down roughly day after day, you keep coming back, you keep coming back. Why do you do that? Why do you externalize it, whether through writing or through paper or through conversation? You do that to program the subconscious because it's always listening. It's firing and wiring itself together. It's discovering patterns. If it says, I always go to the meeting, it's going to believe I always must go to the meeting. If you are describing a different experience where I show up at work on my own terms and I'm only going to go to where I need to go, I'm going to deliver the outcomes that I need to deliver, not going to deal with the other bullshit out there is going to start believing that. And then you're going to start acting differently because you've programmed your mind that way. And it's really powerful when you do something as simple as talking about it again and again, what you want or, or writing it down, how you can feel different and then how you start acting differently. I think there's such power in writing in general. I think the idea that, you know, suffering comes from when, when what we do and what we want is not aligned. Right. And, but I think the challenge is most people don't actually know what they want. Maybe at the surface level, you know, it it comes through and often like material items or, you know, a house or make a lot of money or, you know, have an attractive spouse or kids or whatever, a boat. I don't know. But it's what I've found is it's not until you force yourself to articulate thoughts that are floating around untethered and basically nonsensical in your mind and force yourself to write it down. And I'd really like the idea of doing it over and over. I haven't thought about that. Um, Because you can't, obviously you don't, most people I feel like don't know what they want when they're like, right? They, They have this feeling like they want something else or something's missing. And it's like this internal tension, but just doing something simple, like writing down, tell me what you want. I love the idea of crafting your ideal day. How do, what does your morning look like? How do you start your morning? You know, are you waking up and making fresh coffee? Or are you going for a walk? Is it sunny out? Like, are you sitting on your back porch? What are you doing for lunch? Are you going out to eat all the time? Are you going with friends? Are you doing it by yourself? Are you meal prepping? Like, just like, what are you eating? Where are you going? Where are you going on date night? Where are you going on vacations? Like, just thinking through what gets you excited and putting it on paper. Because only when you force yourself to identify what you want, like that's the only way you're going to get a direction to go. And I, I just feel like it's the only way that you're going to be able to come up with that blueprint. Yeah. Right. Am I missing anything? No, not at all. I mean, the whole idea is when you ask someone what they want, my experience is like maybe 5% can articulate it. Most of it's this jumbled mess of, I want more time to myself. I want to be around my family. I'm like, 
Great generalities, my friend. You need to get a lot more specific if you want your life to change. And then you press them on it and you force them. You give them templates and push them and get their thinking. And it hurts. And it's good. It's like going to the gym. You're growing new muscles. You're thinking in yeah. new ways. You're coming back to that mental gym again and again, building new muscles as far as shaping the life you want, the work, the work experience that you want. Make it on your terms, but you keep sharpening it like a blade. Every time you take it out and you write it down, it comes sharper and sharper and more potent. And then you start living that way. Let me ask you what, you know, for people maybe that are listening to this or in their job and like, like we were just talking about, and I just thought of this because it's like, you know, often we feel something, we feel some tension, right? That's kind of the best way I've figured out how to describe it. And we don't know, or, you know, we don't look forward to waking up Monday morning. You know, we look forward to Friday afternoon when we can finally have a drink because the work week is over, but maybe we don't know why, you know, and I think of, you know, people that are like, man, I don't, something's off, but I'm doing everything right. I, I have a killer job. I, you know, maybe have a brand new car or married or whatever. I'm doing all the things right on paper. So what I was going to ask you is in that situation, maybe people, people feel something is off. How can they recognize what are things they can look at to see if they are actually in the cage? Number one is you're putting all your value in things external to you where you're looking for approval, you're seeking awards, recognitions, promotions, the approval of a, of a spouse, family members, friends, and you're kind of living outside in, where you're just looking around and saying, hey, will you approve of me? Can I do things that make you all like me, that help me fit in? And that means there's no room left for yourself. You've completely left yourself untapped. And you have to flip that, Tim, to actually make it work for you, which is living inside out. And some people will say like, oh, this is that woo-woo self-reflection stuff. I'm like, if you don't do this, if you don't do things like journal and talk about who you are, what lights you up, what drains you, if you don't continually do this and sharpen the world you want, work and home, you're going to feel like a shell of the person you could be. Yeah. You are not going to come close to your potential because you're living for things outside of you. You are not living your true potential, understanding who you are and pushing yourself to follow, you know, and like cultivate passions in your world and some things like we don't find passion. We cultivate it. We experiment. We take a bet. We look at interests in our life and we say, I'm going to go spend time there. I'm going to build something. I'm going to spend mm -hmm. time amongst people like that. If you flip it and live inside out, it's a whole different way of living your life. You're a lot more in control. It's like, Neo, you've taken the red pill now and you see more clearly. You see the BS happening around you. Everyone else who's plugged in living like robots who don't truly understand who they are or what they want. And mm -hmm. you are finally someone who's taking control and saying, I have my own desires in check. I understand what they are. I can specify them, talk about them, pursue them in ways that others cannot. One of my, so how I start my cohort is in an intro call and i just have everybody go around and, and introduce themselves very simple right and 100 percent of the time the first thing that comes out is what they do for work every time and then at the end you know after everybody answers i go i just want you guys to to recognize how you answered this question you know and everybody's face is like oh fuck, you know and so to your point, you know, if you're not, you know, call it whatever, right? That's, you know, whether if you don't like calling it journaling, call it writing, right? That's what I did for the first year. So I felt more comfortable doing it. If you don't like calling it meditation, just sit and breathe with your eyes closed, right? It doesn't have to be complicated. But to your point, like if you're not doing that stuff and you're just in like receive mode, right? You are not controlling the inputs, right? Which of course, if you don't, you're not going to be able to control the outputs. But the, the point you said with like self identity, is if you're not taking time to explore that and learn about yourself, like who, who are you? You know, like, as you mentioned, like, I love the idea of being a shell and where, I mean, probably the most common thing, especially I, I, I see with people, it sounds like obviously with the, with the cage is like work is the center of everything. What I do, who I am, like it is everything about me. And I just like to challenge people to think of, right. Uh, like start dreaming of, a scenario where they were actually themselves first that, you know, they talk about themselves as a human being 
and their interests and what they're into and their best personality traits and their favorite podcasts and the books they're geeking out about and the language they're trying to learn. And then, oh yeah. And then for work, I also do this. You know, it's important. A big piece of our, I'm not like downplaying what we do for work and saying it's not important. It's a massive part of our life. You know, it's very important for human beings to contribute and feel, feel competent in what we do for work. But um, I just, yeah, I love that idea. When you're, when you're not exploring and you're going through the motions, your identity is, you're right. It's a shell. Yeah. And here's something, uh, there's great scientific studies on this, um, that our desires, our wants are not our own. It's explained through something called mimetic desire, where we grow up from very young ages in the household, at school, at work, and subconsciously, we're just wanting what everyone else is wanting. So everyone wants this job, wants to go in this career path, wants to go in this school, wants that car, wants that version of the iPhone. Literally, you're saying, well, I want that too. And you're not choosing to feel that way. You're not choosing but it's being programmed into you because you're enough you're around like-minded people that are all wanting those same things. Mm -hmm. So say, like I came up in the management consulting realm, right? High push for up or out, or you get to partner, or you get kicked out. So it's competitive, elbows, like pushing each other, fighting, political backstabbing. Like it can get pretty ugly sometimes. Yeah. But they all wanted partner because they learned that being a partner and having equity is where it's at. Mm -hmm. That's what life is. Once I'm there, I'm good. And of course, you know, when they get there, they feel like shit, but they yeah. could have seen that coming. But the reality is when you live inside out, going back to our point before, you've taken time to say, nope, I'm going to consciously step away from everything else I've learned and I'm going to do some exploration and figure out what I truly want. And that takes yeah. some hard work, takes a lot of repetition, it's scary, but right? it's important. Yeah. I think it's scary for a lot of people because, you know, for one, a lot of people don't like change. People want to fit in, right? It's It's part of our wiring as human beings. I mean, I think of that. I, I, so I was part of sales organizations and it was just hearing you say that. I was like, shit, man. Like, yeah, people start to be conditioned to want, you know, the the same things as other people, especially within the the team, right? Especially within the sales org. And, and it just turns out like not everybody wants that stuff, like at your core. So that's what I, you know, going back to like what we want and what we do and they're not aligned. That's where suffering comes in. And I mean what we want at a core level. I don't mean like I want a new forerunner. You know, yeah, I'm not sure. able to get it. I mean, like, what do I truly want as a human? And I go back. One thing I love bringing up is a self-realization theory uh, where they talk about human beings need three things to feel com uh, content, you know, which I really think is the is a precursor to any any form of happiness. But one is feeling competent in your work, feeling like you do a damn good job at what you do and you contribute. Uh, the second one is being connected to others, being part of a community. Okay. And then the third one is living an authentic life. And I think, you know, that one's so massive. You can almost start with that one. Like I, I, I personally feel maybe this is just my experience, but I feel like if you cover that last one, you know, the other two will start to take care of themselves. But, yeah. um, you know, I just see that as being such a gap where people don't even like, just like you said, they're not doing what they want to do at a true core level because they don't know what it is. They've never taken the time to, to explore, do self-exploration, write it out, and get really detailed on it so they can go after it. Yeah. Let me, let me pick apart that third term, authenticity, living an authentic life. Yeah. This is all the buzzwordy things. All the thinkers say this. Adam Grant probably has lectures on this out the way. I love Adam Grant. I'm not knocking him. But honestly, like you got to pick apart authenticity and everyone tries to think that they have to be authentic at work. Be yourself, your true one self, be that person everywhere, including work. And that's really hard because like if you have some crazy diverse interests on the side, like you're just like this hardcore CrossFit or, or something. And you're like, how do I bring that to work? <laughs> not simple, right? Like, yeah. this is what I love doing, being in the gym with all these people every single day. And then I'm at work. I'm like, oh, I got to do spreadsheets, PowerPoint. Yeah. What? So it's really hard. So I think more and more authenticity, you might look at it as splitting where you can be authentic. You can actually thrive in being authentic, doing things of your own making, like being in CrossFit, being with friends and family, doing stuff outside of work and actually divorce that from work and look at work. And some might challenge me on this as more of a utility play. Yeah. How do I just get the 
<laughs> most amount of money, compensation, skills, relationships out of that mm -hmm. while doing a good job, but do it for the least amount of effort, right? How do you actually get the most utility out of work and then get out of there so you can be authentic where you feel at home with the people that feel right to you and you yeah. don't try to force it at work? Yeah. And I think it depends too on what you're doing. You know, you might be all in, like you might be very uh, purpose focused in, in what you do for work. I think that's, you know, unfortunately probably the exception though, but of course that's a possibility. But yeah, I think to your point, like authenticity doesn't mean, you know, being the exact same person. Like we're complex beings. You're into different things, you know, like you're not going to, like you act differently, you know, when you're around your spouse than you do when you're around a parent, right. Or your best friends, or like you said, if you're doing CrossFit or, mm -hmm. you know, when I'm, you know, I'm a different person when I'm like on the mat rolling in jujitsu than I am like on a date. That's just how it goes. Mm -hmm. you know? And so, but I think when I think of it, it is like, what is the direction you're going in life? What are you choosing to do? Is it aligned with what you want for your life? What's important to you? How you want to fill your day? Or are you just, you're just kind of on somebody else's tracks right now, you know, and you're just sitting in one of the cars and, you know, it's taking you wherever just because. Yeah. That's the harsh awakening I see all the time. People that are like 10 to 15 years into their career, they've been crushing it. And then they have this harsh realization. They wake up and they shake themselves. Oh my God, is this all there is to life? What am I doing at work? I have no sense of self. I have no time with my family. I'm missing everything. My health is shit. What happened? And then they have this reckoning that they have to go through. Like, that's an important moment. If you're sensing that in yourself, like you're waking up and you don't know what to do with it. Yeah. A powerful transformation you're starting. Listen. Actually go with it. Yeah, listen to it. Don't Fuck just yeah. continue on with what you're doing. This is your inner voice saying, you need to do something radically different. Get the help you need. Do the things you need to do. It's important. Yeah, I love that. That's awesome. Maybe we end with that. I don't know. Yeah. I think that's good. Pay attention uh, when something's going on inside. And yeah, if you start feeling like there's something more to life, you know, reach out to Matter Eye. If you want yeah. somebody to talk to you about it, there definitely is. Um, yeah. Matt, awesome. Anything else you want to you wanna add? Maybe we didn't chat about it's okay if you don't. No, I mean, just generally up. reaffirming that you have all this control that you don't believe you have. You start asserting yourself and crystallizing what the hell you want in your life, making that specific, coming back to it again and again, and then taking little actions in your day, especially at work. So you kind of unlock from that cage and create a life of your own making. That's going to add up in a beautiful way. I love it. I hope this is uh, helpful to people. I feel like it's just a crucial um topic especially now i think there's there's been that awakening especially in the last couple of years so uh matt thanks for coming on how can people find you if um if they want to connect yeah hit me up on linkedin great central place right now i've got a podcast called, Un called uncage yourself i have coaching i have a cohort based course on all this stuff i think you know our audience has had a lot of similar vibes so we'll just keep growing with one another here tim yeah awesome matt thanks again and uh, guys, we'll see you on the next episode, whenever that is. Hey, Matt here. Thanks for listening to Uncage Yourself. For show notes and more content like this, head over to uncageyourself.fm. And if you liked what you heard, I'd appreciate you leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Until next time, be well, my friend.